Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. There's been a lot of discussion this year about the potential benefits of AI in medicine. And today we're talking about how One Health System put AI into practice and some of the early results that they're seeing. I'm joined today by Dr. Vincent Liu, a senior research scientist and the regional medical director of Augmented Clinical Intelligence at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Clara, California. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Liu, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you, Todd. Thank you. Now, before we get into the discussion, I'm uh, uh, very curious about your title. Of course, it says, not artificial intelligence, but augmented clinical intelligence, and I'm gonna bet that's intentional. Will you just comment? on those choice of words? Yeah, oh, absolutely. When I think of AI and when, when we think of it in our medical group, the Permanente Medical Group, we think of it as augmented rather than artificial intelligence. And that's because augmented intelligence places people, patients, communities, and clinicians at its centers, at its center rather than algorithms. So it's an important focus for us that really this is technology that augments the capability of our physicians. Um, rather than just focused on the development of algorithms. And a great focus that is. Uh, despite the fact that it feels like we're hearing about AI all the time right now, uh, obviously uh, AI technology has been in place for some time and Kaiser Permanente has been leveraging it for years. One example of that is your Advanced Alert Monitor program. Let's start by telling the audience out there a little bit about the program and the AI technology that makes it possible? Certainly, um, Advanced Alert Monitor, or AEM, is designed to identify high-risk patients in the hospital who are at risk for adverse events, like impending admission to the ICU or unexpected death. And so it's been known for some time that these patients are at risk, and the question was, could we leverage AI algorithms and machine learning in order to really prevent and respond uh, to these patients. So over the past uh, several years, we've used millions, hundreds of millions of data points from our hospitalized patients and granular EHR data, things like lab values, vital signs, other key clinical data to develop a machine learning algorithm um, that worked with good accuracy to predict patients at risk for deterioration in the next 12 hours. So early enough to actually intervene and hopefully prevent. Um, while that was an exciting achievement, the development of an algorithm, again, akin to the augmented intelligence was not enough. It had to then be paired with a robust workflow. So we worked with extraordinary clinicians and teams across our 21 hospitals here in Northern California to develop workflows that made sense in response to an AM alert. We also worked with palliative care, social work, regional health education to understand how do you inform patients about algorithms which are looking at their data in real time and trying to help them. Um, and also uh, making sure that patients' goals of care are aligned with the response. Because when someone's deteriorating, not every patient wants more invasive or aggressive maneuvers um, to be done. We worked with many technologists uh, on this as well. Our results were published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that the implementation of AAM within this entire program, uh, working closely with clinicians, reduced mortality, reduced the rate of ICU transfers, and is estimated to save as much as 500 lives per year across our hospitals. So that was a really exciting object lesson for us and how we could leverage AI and machine learning to improve the care of our patients. But again, making sure that it was closely tied with what made sense for our clinicians and patients. Uh, what a great example and your point that you know, the technology, uh, just one piece of the overall operation workflow and the human element, both from the physician and of course the patient objectives, like you pointed out. Uh, that's just one way that you've taken advantage of uh, AI. What are some of the other ways that this technology is starting to play a key role in your strategy? Yeah, there are different aspects. As you know, AI can become a, a specialist in many different domains. So one example would be using natural language processing to examine the contents of messages between patients and physicians. As we all know, physicians are increasingly being overwhelmed 
by the volume of uh, these messages and finding it challenging to really understand, you know, how do we sort them? You know, the ones that are most urgent, the ones which really don't need a physician's attention, and then the, probably the ones in between where it's, it's not clear and it, it needs to initiate a more complex conversation. So over the past several years, a team here at KP has been working on using natural language processing to actually examine these notes and begin to put them into buckets that have a very, again, strongly paired uh, workflow. So whether it's a uh, workflow related to COVID vaccination or Paxlovid, or when are these facilities, you know, what are the hours of these facilities um, or, you know, uh, routine prescription refills, you know, making sure that those get sorted appropriately, passed on to the right people, and those concerns are addressed. Um, of course, is sometimes uh, more emergent or concerning symptoms come through and making sure that we can leverage technology to escalate those to appropriate parties to make sure that those are seen, you know, as, as timely as possible so they can be addressed. Uh, this kind of technology is in place today. It's uh, analyzing and sorting on average a million messages per month uh, across our system. So you just think about that type of scale. Um, that's the opportunity we have with this technology is really to, um, you know, have tremendous speed and uh, scale with uh, deploying, deploying it for our clinicians. I'll just cite another example, which is, you know, uh, people are really excited about is, which is the use of computer vision for imaging. So what we've done, uh, investigators here at KP have looked at um, thousands or tens of thousands of images like breast mammograms and found that uh, computer vision algorithms can identify high-risk features even within screening mammograms that were called normal by radiologists. And when we pair those um, with workflows, uh, there's the potential to increase the, identif the identification of patients who may be at risk for breast cancer from 20% using traditional approaches to as much as 60 to 70% using, uh, again, this computer vision augmentation. Um, and that unlocks a lot of opportunities, personalized screening recommendations uh, for people at risk for breast cancer, um, targeted outreach for patients who are overdue for screening, or even the potential to rapidly look at images on the same day and you know, avoid having patients come back for a second visit, uh, you know, escalate those images for immediate review and have the patient stay there to get their care in one visit. So there's, there's opportunities uh, that we're looking at and implementing. Again, what the hard work is often that integration between our clinicians and workflows and this technology, making sure that they work closely together. Uh, those are three great examples. Uh, again, the you know, one you just talked about on the diagnostic augmentation side. And then I love where you started out too, because I see that coming through as a theme and a lot of the discussions that I'm having uh, with AI experts, which is using the technology to reduce the burdens on physicians. And I think uh, for anybody that's not familiar with uh, what probably does feel like a million messages coming through uh, from patients to doctors through the portal, uh, significant uh, level of burden. Uh, and we know that things mm -hmm. like that uh, combined with other things that folks face, uh, you know, are definite indicators of burnout. So it's good to see that technology mm -hmm. uh, get, get to uh, put to work that way. I'm curious, I know it's kind of early in the process for initiatives like the ones that you're describing, but are you seeing results that you can quantify? Are you getting the kind of feedback that you want to hear both from your physicians and, and from patients? Yeah, I mean, I think there's overwhelming pride when we show that, you know, the implementation of AAM reduces death among our hospitalized patients, as many as 500 per year. Um, and, you know, that uh, our readmission risk score uh, reduces high risk uh, readmissions um, by as much as a 10 percent. You know, there's there's a lot of pride in that across the institution that we're leveraging our patients technology really to help them and to help our clinicians identify the highest risk patients. Um, but it is a very complex process because we, I'm gonna be honest, we hear the good and the bad. 
You know, I think our clinicians are extremely overburdened as they are everywhere. And so I think of them as running at 100% full or sometimes even more. So as we think about integrating these technologies, we need to think about uh, a, a remove or replace. If we're gonna add something, it has to either replace a, a, a task that they do and make it more efficient. That's a win for everyone. Or it has to remove something else because I think there are some out there who say, let's put this alert and then this technology and these alerts. And they're, they all seem like great things when they're considered independently. But, you know, again, they, they begin to produce alert fatigue, distraction, um, and other concerns. So it's something we are um, approaching uh, very cautiously and, um, you know, making sure that our clinicians are bought in and then ultimately testing it, right? Because uh, if they stand the test of time, which is if they produce better patient outcomes, you know, it really strengthens uh, the level of support for these types of tools, um, even when occasionally some of them may produce some excess uh, burden or work for our clinicians, but really to um, prevent uh, adverse outcomes among our, uh, uh, among our patients uh, is the goal. I uh, really love and appreciate that remove or replace paradigm that you're talking about because so much of what we've seen in technology and medicine has been an ad uh, that has added right. to that burden. Uh, and so uh, paying attention to that and being able to demonstrate the kind of results that you're talking about to build momentum toward uh, just a, uh, an unburdened future uh, has got to be pretty exciting uh, for folks there. Now, physicians aren't the only ones that are thinking about the benefits of AI. Uh, they're also thinking about the risks, as you pointed out, and the need for new regulations and guidelines. When you implemented these AI-powered programs, you know, what kind of policies did you update or put in place to kind of deal uh, with that ingoing? And then, you know, as you explore things, like you've said along the way that pop up. Yeah, I think this is an area of growth right now for a lot of health systems. We have partnerships and collaborations and informal, you know, conversations with a lot of our health system partners. And this is where there's a lot of attention and, uh, uh, you know, resources going right now. So I will say that I think um, even though AI is new and exciting, there's elements of it that are very much uh, aligned with what's happened before, whether that's the use of technology or algorithms, right? We already use hundreds or thousands of algorithms um, in our practice today. And those may be as simple as if the patient has this, do, you know, if the level is above this, do this, if not, do that, right? And so that's something that can be written on a paper. Anybody can understand that. But that's still an algorithm and somebody had to approve it. It had to go through the stakeholders. It has to be maintained. And at some regular interval, it has to be reassessed whether you know, that decision point makes sense. Um, so I think there are lots of um, uh, forums in a health system in place today, you know, whether those are stakeholder groups, um, domain experts, technology, um, governance and oversight groups. Um, that maintain the um, the process of kind of uh, oversight, you know, to make sure that all stakeholders are engaged and the decision to move forward and endorse something um, is there. And so uh, we utilize a similar framework to that. I think where there's um, uh, a, a lot of new growth that needs to happen is we need to be training up our physicians and our clinicians to understand what is AI? What is data science? You know, how do I enter a room uh, or, you know, an industry conversation and understand, you know, whether or not the technology they're speaking about is really, you know, is, is, is there something there that we care about or is it kind of a flash in the pan? You know, what, what is reinforcement learning? What are large language models? You know, how do I need to think about bias and fairness evaluation? So there's a lot of training that needs to happen uh, specialization uh, and development of a workforce that kind of serves that translator function. You know, they both understand the clinical deployment of these tools, but they also understand uh, something about that technology. Um, and I think that's something, you know, we as an entire field uh, need to be invested in. Not only that governance and oversight process within an individual health system or a practice, but then, you know, building up a workforce that's capable of making those 
um, informed decisions, and then ultimately guiding the deployment of this technology into practice. So I'm curious what's next on the agenda in terms of new capabilities or new tools that you're hoping to implement over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, there's so much exciting stuff on the frontier. I think uh, I, I can speak to what I think is almost mature or really entering into workflow. Um, computer vision, you know, whether that's radiology, dermatology, pathology, EKGs or EEGs. We've seen just the large expansion of these technologies and then their integration into products. And so I think that's a very tangible um, next step. And a lot of those conversations are happening in, in partnership with our uh, industry and you know other medical technology uh, companies. I think there's been huge excitement about large language models. You know, is there a way that we can leverage these very very complex and large statistical models to improve communication with our patients? Can they auto draft our notes or our secure messages? I think there's potential there, but we have to use it cautiously. I think what is really exciting is that they can also help with information retrieval. You know, a burden clinicians face is, well, you know, this patient is a complex patient. Um, they may have been seen at different places. How do I synthesize everything that's happened over the past six months when they've been in and out of the hospital and been to surgery and actually really make a decision today based on the best information that I have? And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity for these large language models to um, improve our capability to kind of uh, glean that information from the chart. And so we're pretty excited about that, but again, something we approach with caution uh, because we still very much feel that the human needs to be in the loop. You know, it needs a human handler who's able to shut it down if it's not working, you know, the way that, the way that we want it to be working. Uh, risk prediction models uh, continue to be, um, you know, built and implemented I think, you know, trying to make uh, the process of finding the needle in the haystack better, right? And so the, the, the better the technologies get, the more granular information, I think um, the, the more capabilities we'll have there. And then, you know, I think into the future, it's treatment recommender systems and, you know, precision medicine with omics. Um, and there's going to be robotics and augmented reality and, you know, so there's, you know, the technology is advancing at an incredible pace. We're going to see a plethora of products. Um, it's a matter of, again, solving real actual problems for our patients and clinicians and doing it in a way that's safe and sustainable. Now, that is a pretty exciting future. And of course, the core of that is innovation, something that you are working uh, to do and encourage on the outside of your health system, too. You've mm -hmm. got a New grant program for AI and machine learning and healthcare. Tell us a little bit more about how you're trying to drive innovation uh, inside and outside of uh, Permanente. Yeah, so this is called the AIM High program, which is Augmented Intelligence in Medicine and Healthcare Initiative. It was funded through a generous grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And so they looked at the work that we were doing in integrating and proving the effectiveness of AI and machine learning and what they wanted us to do was to identify three to five health systems who submitted proposal uh, to fund them to actually do rigorous tests of uh, the impact of AI uh, on, their, on their patient outcomes. So what we have is a plethora of papers and technologies that say we perform beautifully well um, and we do this and that. What we don't have is actual real world evidence that those claims are, are it can actually be um, justified based on this kind of rigorous study design. So this is really where this uh, grant mechanism uh, comes in. We are offering as much as $750,000 for each of three to five health systems. We've received over 120 applications um, thus far um, and are going through the process of identifying, I think, the most promising ones. Um, and, you know, what we want this work to do is develop best practices, shared understanding for scalability, and hopefully prove um, that AI uh, in the right context with the right level of integration really has an important role to play in making our healthcare better. Well, last question uh, for our conversation. Obviously, if you're paying attention, there's a lot of scrutiny in Washington about the use of AI in healthcare. Uh, 
uh, just big meeting last week with, of course, President Biden uh, on setting out guidelines uh, in AI. What's one thing that you want policymakers to keep in mind or get done in this space? Yeah, I mean, in, regulations are incredibly important. You know, it, it, it's what's going to make sure that we are putting these appropriate guardrails in place. Um, you know, I and uh, I, I think getting some voluntary endorsement from these companies to um, examine their practices and add transparency to the process um, is going to be essential. I do think there is a stage at which um, regulations um, can stifle some of the innovation, for example, the kind that we've seen in our own health system. You know, our mission is to use our patients' data most effectively to improve their outcomes and to improve our clinicians' manner of care. You know, it's been less about commercializing those products, right? So it's, it's developed on the data in which it's applied, and it's really tied to um, health system um, uh, workflows. Um, and I think in those cases, uh, when, when it's done within a specific medical practice or within a specific health system, there is a role for providing a safe harbor in some ways um, from the same regulations, um, you know, so that we can innovate, so that we can use our best data to improve our patient's care rather than kind of saying, well, you know, to, to deploy a technology like this, we'd have to go through a, a bunch of um, fairly challenging regulatory steps. Um, and so our patients wouldn't actually benefit from that. Um, you know, and so I think that is a fine line to walk, but I think would be an important one uh, because it maintains the spirit of innovation and the application of data right to the patients in whom it can benefit. Um, and the, the other concern that I have is that if, if the re regulatory um, mandates become extremely strong, health systems are not prepared or, or practices are not prepared to do that. We're not uh, companies that uh, typically have FDA or other types of regulatory arms, um, it will pr produce a, a pretty large burden. And I think the byproduct of that will actually strengthen the control of technology companies over patients' data and their products. Essentially, you know, if, if we're unable to keep up with the regulatory kind of uh, uh, overhead, it will mean that companies will purchase all that data, make the products, and sell all of it back. Um, and I think that reduces the autonomy of health systems and practices really, again, to use their own patient's data to produce better outcomes, um, you know, in patient care and ultimately in clinician practice. Dr. Liu, it has been such a pleasure to have you today and hear uh, your perspective and the progress that is being made already. Uh, hearing these kind of stories and uh, where you've come in the past few years, it really is an antidote to a lot of hysteria that we kind of see out there in regard to AI. Uh, I can't wait to hear back from you as you continue your progress and you can update us on the results. That's it for today's AMA update and we'll be back soon with another segment. In the meantime, you can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care.